Uh, before I uh, before I get on to the hot stuff, in other words, the post Civil War uh, material, um, I just want to say a little bit about um, a revisionist, a new revisionist book, a great book that's come out in the history of American technology. Not usually one of my my major interests, but. Um, and the history of American technology is usually, has usually been written as sort of in a boring fashion, like this machine does this, this does that, and there's a flying shuttle and the loom and all that stuff. But uh, David Hounshaw wrote a famous and excellent book in 1985 called From the American System to Mass Production. What he meant by American system was not the Henry Clay kind of tariff thing. He meant technologically the system of mass production and interchangeable parts. And uh, it was an excellent book. It's one of the best... Uh, description I've ever seen of the importance of the bicycle, let's say, in 1890s, what he shows, what Hounshaw shows is that the, what he does is he integrates technological history with social and economic history, especially social. And he shows that the, the necessary preparation for the automobile, which comes in about 1900, was the bicycle. Because the bicycle, which flourishes in 1890s, gets people, gets people, customers used to the idea of being mobile, not being stuck with a damn train route, you know, of actually, you know, being individual and mobile, not being stuck with mass, mass trains. And two, it gets technologists used to the idea of the wheel on the axle and handling all that and the rubber tire. And all this was necessary preparation for the automobile, which many of the first automobile shops were bicycle shops. Where they were already used to axles and, 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 and tires and things like that. And it was also a great, excellent description of Henry Ford and what he did for mass production. The problem with the Hounshaw book for me, the troubling part of it was, he claimed that mass production comes to America first in government armories. Uh, and the government armies were, were or government contracted military industrial complex armories where you, they didn't have to worry about costs or economics and things like that because they can indulge in their, what he called technological enthusiasm and just be, be perfect, not worry about economics. And then this armory knowledge in the armories of mass production then spread to private enterprise. Well, there's a new book by Donald Hoke, H-O-K-E, called uh, Ingenious Yankees, <clears throat> which Columbia University Press, 1990. Hoke is not an enemy of Hounshaw. He's an old friend of his, and he's a roommate and all that, part of the same uh, Eleutherian Mills Hagley Foundation movement, so to speak. By the way, it's a great, just in passing, uh, Eleutherian Mills Hagley Foundation is a DuPont museum and library which specializes in American business history, American technology, technological history, especially in the Delaware Valley. It's a wonderful place. It's, got, it's very plush. It's got about eight very competent librarians per every customer, so just, they're just super. <laughs> if you have any, anyway, I strongly recommend it. Anyway, Hoke, what Hoke says is he, he's a revisionist on this whole thing. He says Hoke Hounshaw is wrong for various reasons. That the uh, uh, mass production of inter interchangeable parts begins with a heroic figure named uh, Eli Terry, who was a uh, genius mechanic, namely engineer uh, in those days, and uh, <clears throat> entrepreneur who made discovered a way to make mass-produced wooden movement clocks. And the clocks is complicated, the thing has to fit together and all that. He was, uh, before that, in 1807, before 1807, long before armories began this thing, in 1800, before that, uh, clocks were hand handmade. So if you made 100 clocks a year, you're doing very well. He was able to, to make it so that he was turning out 3,000 clocks a year, which is absolutely unheard of. And he did it by, by technological invention, bound by, not only by technological enthusiasm, obviously, but also by economics. And he was constantly looking for the reducing costs, lowering price, so that he can have, you know, tap a mass market. And uh, he first he reduced costs on one thing, and this would lead to bottlenecks, and he re re reduced costs on that. And so the whole thing was, was very logically derived at, uh, driven by economics, as well as economic considerations as well as technological. <clears throat> uh, he starts it. Uh, and also made the clock, which previously had been a luxury item for the rich, into actually a you know, very cheap item for the mass of the public. After that, uh, in the 1830s and 40s came private axe manufacturing, which had previously been handcrafted and now became uh, mass produced. Uh, Elisha K. Root was a heroic figure there. Interestingly enough, instead of the armory starting the thing and then shifting to private enterprise, just the opposite. Uh, Elisha K. Root, who, was, who managed to produce mass. Uh, production in axe, axe manufacturing, uh, then moves the coal firearms factory and, and apply the same tech tactics or techniques to, to arms production. So it's just the other way around. It starts with private enterprise and then shifts, uh, influences government enterprise after that. Also, he points out, uh, Hoke, that the whole thing, both the, both the clocks and also the 
uh, the uh, axe industry, and later that, the typewriter industry, a very complicated systems approach a little later on, and also the Waltham Watch Company later on. All this was done purely private, no government subsidy, no government contracts, no government interest, no nothing. So it's kind of a, kind of a charming thing for, for free market types to realize this. So we redeemed the history of American technology from government armories. Anyway, I strongly recommend it. Also, he said the, the problem with the reason why Hounschel and the other historians made a mistake on this, they don't know much about technology. They go through the documents. They don't really care much about the object. This guy's an antiquarian. He started as an antiquarian of technology. There's a whole movement of antiquarians who sit around looking at these, these objects, you see. And so he said the key is the object, and you can tell what's going on. One interesting thing here, just the, just the last point, he said was the armory people, since they didn't care about cost, they made perfect perfect uh, interchangeable parts, which means it's very costly because one thing breaks, you know, if it doesn't fit, you just have to throw the thing out or whatever. But the pri these private guys did, like, uh, Rich, like uh, Eli Terry and, uh, and Elisha Rich, is they, they made adjustable parts. So the, the, each part with a screw or something becomes adjustable. It's going to fit in very easily, which made it much cheaper and much, uh, much lower cost. <clears throat> so anyway, that's a uh, good point for the, for the private market. <clears throat> for social power as against state power. Okay, again, after the Civil War, we get to, uh, we have a new, whole new setup as, as Pennsylvania, if my friend Jeff Herbener lives in Pennsylvania, was, I reassured him that Pennsylvania stops being the center of evil about 1870 <laughs> after the, after the, uh, after the uh, collapse of Jay Cook. The focus begins to shift to New York, Wall Street, and um, <laughs> other areas. <laughs> the... Uh, Replacing Jay Cook as the, as the evil investment banker uh, was J.P. Morgan, you've all heard of. Now, there's nothing wrong with investment banking per se. It's a, it's a fine occupation. The problem is, of course, as I say, one is the major problem is they engage in a lot of government bonds. In addition to that, <clears throat> J.P. Morgan begins, first of all, investing in the railroads. He manages to control most of the railroads in the country by the 1860s and 70s, <clears throat> uh, especially after Cook uh, goes bankrupt. And he immediately starts, he realizes freight rates are going down. It's a tremendous expansion of railroads. There's a tremendous drop in freight rates. Everybody loves it, except the railroads. They wanted, and, and Morgan and other people decide, we have to have a cartel. We have the whole the beginning of business cart cartelization in the United States. Time and time again, you know, Coco's book, Railroads and Regulation, goes to the whole story of this. Morgan gets all the big railroad guys together and says, OK, let's have a cartel. Now, those of you, undoubtedly, most of you know about cartel theory. <laughs> Most people think cartels are very easy. Three guys get together, manufacturers of, you know, whatever, the washing machines, whatever, and they get together over drinks at the Union League Club. And one guy says, Jim, why don't we raise prices? Yeah, that's a great idea. Why don't I think, let's raise prices. <laughs> and, then, and then they have a secret price agreement. They raise prices, and they're all happy. It ain't the way that works. Because as you all know, I, I hope, the, uh, in order to raise prices and make it viable, you have to cut production. You have to go up the demand curve. The demand curves are always falling. They're not, they're not vertical. And therefore, they've got to agree on cutting production. No businessman ever likes to cut production. They hate it. They like to expand production. They have to grow. And so cutting production is a big pain in the neck to begin with. Second of all, if you cut production, you have to base it on some base year. Like if, you, if, you want to, if, we, if three of us want to form a cartel starting in 1991, we have to base it, let's say, in 1991 output. So we each cut our output by 10%, let's say. Well, as time goes on, 1992, three, these these 1991 quotas become obsolete. Conditions change. Watch. And the, each business man says, why am I stuck with this damn quota of 1990? I, I can have a better machine now. I have better people. I have better raw materials. I got a new invention. I can outbid these guys if I weren't stuck with this goddamn quota. And so each, each businessman is itching to break the agreement. <clears throat> and the way to break the agreement is you go down, of course, your firm's demand curve, your elastic demand curve, is against the industry's inelastic, and particularly engage in secret price cutting. It's a wonderful way of breaking a cartel. You go to some customer and say, look, Jim, uh, either the other guy's customer or your customer, you say, look, you, you, then, you, then you do drinks at Union League Club. And you say, look, Jim, for you, since you're my, my old buddy and a fellow elk or whatever, I will give you a 10% cut in the price. But don't tell anybody because we're stuck with this goddamn list price of which agreed upon cartel price. And the guy says, of course, they won't tell anybody. This is not bribery, by the way. This is simply a cut in, in agreed upon price. And he gets the business. He flourishes. It's great. He gets more money. But then, of course, Eventually, uh, industrial secrets don't last too long. The, you know, the other guys find out about it. The other cartelists, they, they're bitter, they're sore. And the whole cartel breaks up in vicious recrimination. You know, back down to the old price again, except now they're, they're bitter at each other instead of friendly. So that's the, what you can call the internal pressure that breaks the cartel. 
And Morgan found, by the way, internal pressure was constant. There's one charming story. I love this story about the Iowa pool. Uh, Julius Grodinsky is an excellent book. He was a great railroad historian. A book called The Iowa Pool, which deal, there are three key road, railroad routes competing against each other. Because railroads compete. <clears throat> uh, they compete even if they're not the same route. They're, they, they're near each other. and different, They compete geographically. Three key routes from Omaha, which is the terminus of the Central Pacific Railroad going to the west, excuse me, the Union Pacific Railroad going to the west, and uh, Chicago. The three ways to do it. Two of these roads were owned by one guy, James Joy, known as the Railroad King, I think. So you think it would be easy to have a cartel. The Jim, Jim Joy himself, his left hand, his right hand, and the other guy get together over drinks. <laughs> and they have, they say, well, cut shipment. And railroads, of course, is cutting shipments. But production, of course, is shipping freight. <clears throat> and they raise rates and all that. Everything's fine. Except what happens is there's internal pressure to break the cartel because the vice president's in charge of sales. Sales manager, your whole life is wrapped up in sales. You don't care about the, the big boss's agreement. Each of, the vice pre, each of James Joy's vice chairman, vice presidents of sales broke the agreement, had secret discounting to try to pick up sales for his railroad. He didn't care that the other guys, the other railroad was also owned by the same guy. You, could, you can't even keep competition out from your own companies, okay? <laughs> the second big, so internal pressure is one thing that always breaks the cartel, and the other thing that breaks the cartel is external pressure. What happens is, these three guys, whether it's railroads or, or washing machines or whatever, they, they have a cartel, they, raise the, they cut production, they raise the price, they have more profits. There's always a lot of capital looking for higher profits. And other outside capital said, hey, these guys over there, they have a great racket here. They have, they're getting 20% profits out of 10 or something. Let's go in and build another railroad or another washing machine factory. We'll not compete these guys. <clears throat> New guy comes in, <clears throat> and you're back down to square one again. The cartel is busted, except now you've got a brand new dangerous competitor with brand new equipment. Okay? So it's even more dangerous, you're even worse off than you were before. Same thing happened with railroads. New railroads would be built without compete, with lower costs, without compete with the old railroads. The whole thing was a flopperoo. And I'm willing to stick my neck out and say that no cartel in the history of the world has ever succeeded on the free market for any length of time for these two reasons. So what you have to have to, make, to keep a cartel successful is to have a government enforce it. <clears throat> And yeah, government can say, you must obey the price regulation, must obey the, the quota regulation, and, and keep new entrants out of the field. Uh, in other words, the government becomes the cartel enforcer. Now, Morgan brought over from Germany, a, a veteran, of course, Germany's had, had cartels long before we did, <clears throat> a veteran railroad cartelist, that was a professional railroad cartel manager called Albert Fink. And Fink tried to organize cartels and always flopped in six months and all that sort of stuff. And finally, Fink gave a speech, I think it was before the railroad industry, I think in the late 70s or so, and he says, look, cart railroad cartels are not going to work. It's just not going to work. We need to call on the government to enforce it. So railroads decide to call on the government, but they have a problem, a problem I mentioned, alluded to last hour, namely, how do they get the public to accept this? And the way to get them to accept it is we're fighting. The propaganda beams out. We, we need government regulation to combat big business monopoly. Notice the magnificent, it's a beautiful shell game. So it's a, a principle of reversal and con men or something, right? You try, you're try, you're, 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 there's too much competition for you. You want to use the government to impose monopoly, led by big business, big railroads. And so you tell the public, we need government regulation in order to curb the big business monopoly. <clears throat> so the railroads wrote the law. They lobbied for it. <clears throat> now it's the Interstate Commerce Act, the first regulatory commission. They wrote the law, they lobbied before they wrote, they drafted it, and they staffed the first commissioners. The whole thing was railroad run. And the first thing the ICC did was try to raise the freight rates to the point that Morgan tried to get it and it flopped on the free market. They didn't try to lower the rates, they tried to raise them. So, uh, <clears throat> and one of the ways which the agitation for was, and also the, what the ICC tried to do first, was to outlaw secret price cutting. It's another very clever propaganda trick. Remember, the way the cartel gets busted internally is by secret price cut. If you do it openly, the, the other firms will immediately follow you and won't pick up any money. So, so, so the, in the name of stopping secrecy, secrecy bad, openness good. Okay? <laughs> so you have to outlaw secret price cutting, secret re rebates, freight, freight rate rebates, and it's a terrible name. And in the name of advancing competition of the public interest. So the public interest, the common wheel, the common good, the general welfare, all the other junk, <laughs> was used as a gimmick, as a, as a smokescreen, to push through uh, big, big railroad, in this case, cartelization. <clears throat> and, so, and the average person, gee, open this good. Yeah, yeah, open the books. 
uh, don't cut secretly, and of course, it take, tries to take away the weapon of breaking cartels. The ICC was not very successful, even so, and they kept trying to strengthen it, from, down through Teddy Roosevelt, strengthen ICC power. <coughs> uh, <coughs> so, um, and we have um, the, um, and this, this, I think, this is true of every regulatory commission from then on, the whole progressive movement, which, which what really happens is big, railroads are the first big business coming in the 1870s, 80s. By the 1890s, uh, manufacturing becomes a big business. Manufacturing was partnerships. For example, Standard Oil begins as a partnership. Uh, most other manufacturing firms are partnerships. They only begin to become corpor incorporated by the 1880s and 90s. And so manufacturers thought the whole thing, they want to do something about this too. They want to restrict competition because pr their prices were falling. Uh, and they start the whole progressive movement's idea of regulatory commissions, prog progressive welfare legislation, all the rest of it. Uh, one thing I want to emphasize here is, that the, is the, uh, what I call the Ralph Nader Golden Age myth. The Ralph Nader Golden Age myth, the Ralph Nader types will admit that regulatory commissions are now in the pocket of big business, okay? That the, the rare, the whatever, the, the insurance industry uh, regulators are in the pocket of big business. They, they have to go to parties together and all that. But the Golden Age myth, is a, it started out as a wonderful thing. All these regulatory commissions, the progressive, in the old days, were progressive and wonderful, and they, they pushed the public interest. But after about 30, 40 years, they started revolving doors of big business. The whole thing got lax and it got corrupted. So this, this, the real story is there ain't no, there wasn't any, there ain't no golden age. The, uh, business groups wrote the legislation, drafted it, and staffed it from the very beginning. So the whole thing was a cart, cart, cartel plot plan, I should say, from the very beginning. Uh, <clears throat> and this is going to irritate Matt, Matt Hoffman here, but the re why the question is why did why did Cleveland was basically a laissez-faire Democrat. Uh, why did he go along with the Interstate Commerce Commission? Why did he sign it? Uh, it I believe because he, he was essentially a Morgan person. He, his whole life was in the Morgan ambit, even though he's laissez-faire oriented in general. And as I told Matt, he's my second favorite president. Uh, my first favorite is Matthew, Martin Van Buren. My second favorite president is Cleveland. My third favorite is Warren Harding, kind of lovable character, uh, who did nothing in the White House except play poker and, and play around with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, it was the the the, the, the Cleveland Cleveland himself was a Morgan lawyer. His, his he was a Buffalo Railroad lawyer, um, and um, he then his law partner for many years and friend and law partner was Francis Lynn Stetson, who was uh, Stetson, who was Morgan's personal attorney. His cabinet was almost completely Morgan oriented, um, and um, the Morgans actually weren't that bad in those days, except for the <laughs> railroad regulation, and that, they got much worse later on. Uh, the, um, one of, by the way, one of the problems with Chicago school historians, to the extent that economic historians of Chicago school deal with this stuff, the extent they go beyond econometrics and equations, uh, they recognize that, that, that these, these regulatory commissions were basically for the benefit of cartelization and big business. Where they slip up, and aside from the fact they don't do much of it, but they slip up as they don't recognize the financial interests. That finance, investment banking, for example, is a cross-industry process, and they managed to integrate network, financial networks, which control a whole series of industries. So that's why they ignore the Morgan uh, Rockefeller type, Morgan uh, Kuhn Loeb, et cetera, influence. <clears throat> uh, the, um, <clears throat> okay, the uh, political parties, uh, I should say, I don't want to go too much into this because I could spend the whole many hours on it, but the, the political party system in that period was very different from the current system. The entire 19th century political party system was, to me, would be seventh heaven, since I love political politics anyway, political party struggles. Political parties in the 19th century, and this, this, by the way, undercuts the whole public choice analysis, which is that, that political parties are always worthless and they don't do any, there's no ideological influence. Political parties in those days were fiercely ideological. They hated each other because they had diff totally different sets of principles. And that's why, when I was growing up in the 1930s, you had all these old codgers. I, only vote Dem I vote only Democrat or only Republican because my grandpappy voted Democrat, my pappy voted Democrat. It sounds idiotic. I mean, loyal to the, to the Democrat or Republican party. What does that mean? It's ridiculous. It wasn't ridiculous in the 19th century. Uh, because in the 19th century, these parties were sets of principles. They didn't always hold to the principles, but they were pretty much so. I mean, remarkably so. They had sets of ideological principles, uh, which they, and they socialized and they, their, their members. In other words, they, they educated the members, and the members kept them, kept them on the straight and narrow. 
One interesting thing about it was, nowadays, of course, we have the floating voters. We have an you know, increasing number of percentage of voters are independent. And so we have 60, 70, 80% independent or whatever. So during campaigns, the politicians get even less principled than they are the rest of the time, because they're trying to catch the floating voters. They, they become indistinguishable during campaigns. It was just the opposite of the 19th century. What a wonderful period it was to live. Because in the 19th century, if a guy wanted to waffle, he couldn't waffle in campaigns. Usually the, the races were very, were very close. Okay? So outside of the South, they were very close. And the, it's just no Democrat would ever vote for a Republican or vice versa, consider them evil, satanic. But they'd stay home. If your guy waffled and started leaking, as, as Leonard Reed would put it, they just stayed home. They said, heck with it, and they'd lose. So in order to get your vote out, you have to be even tougher and more, more hardcore than you were during the rest of the time. What a, what a great period. Mm. So uh, you had then the, the Democratic Party throughout the entire 19th century until 1896, you can pinpoint the time, was the laissez-faire party devoted to free trade, minimal government, hard money, uh, uh, all the rest, everything goes along with it, no public works. Uh, and the Federalist, Whig, Republican parties were devoted to statism, big government, uh, protective tariffs, excise taxes, uh, Central banking, inflation, the whole business, the whole, the whole set it was t totally opposite ide ideologies. And one of the reasons why the ideology was so deeply rooted was religion. I think, and one of the problems I have with, with secular historians, approximately 1920 to 1970, is they're not religious at all. There's nothing wrong, in my view, with not being religious. The point of not being religious at all, they think that throughout history, nobody could have taken religion seriously. So they, they just ignore it as a motivation for ideology and action. <clears throat> On the contrary, most people have been religious, strongly religious in the history of the world. And what happens is with these parties, they were rooted in clashing religious values, which, and the way it worked was this. Uh, the, for example, the Republican Party, the Whig and particularly the Republican Party, starting about 1830s, okay, Whig and Republican, the Protestant churches, in, particularly in the North, uh, particularly in Yankee country, which is essentially New England, through northern Illinois, uh, northern Michigan, uh, northern Ohio, it's northern Indiana. This Yankee area in particular, but general northern Protestants and general northern Protestants were swept and changed their entire religious outlook, entire religious theology and ethics. They were changed in a sweep, in a massive sweep of revival movements around 1820s and 30s, which transformed Protestantism. So the Protestants now was what we call, we call post-millennial pietists. In other words, they believed uh, but it's the, it's the it's the obligation of mankind. Jesus will not return. Of course, all Christian theology is that Jesus will eventually uh, return to earth and establish the uh, uh, day of judgment. Uh, the, um, this particular wing of it believes that in order for Jesus to return, you, man first has to establish the kingdom of God on earth, a thousand-year millennium, so that Jesus can return. This is called post-millennial pietism. In other words, uh, Jesus will return to earth after the thousand-year millennium. It means man has to establish a millennium. What is the millennium? Well, there are different series of this. Uh, almost always it's heavily statist, not in all case, but generally. Uh, often kami, uh, the kingdom of God on earth is going to be perfect, consists of perfect people. Perfect people don't have private property. They have everything in common. They love each other and they're equal. Okay? So you have a very strong statist component with, with, with post-millennialists. Uh, and uh, the, uh, these Protestant churches then believed that uh, in particular, we have, to govern, we have to stamp out sin. In order, you know, we have to be perfect. How do you get people to be perfect? Either you can slaughter every, all heretics now, which is they try to do in the 16th century, or you can try to shape them up for a while. Okay? And the only way you can shape them up is by government. So the, the uh, post-millennial millennial pietists adopted the doctrine that you need the state, as, as Richard T. Ely, one of my least favorite economists in the history of the United States, economist, social philosopher, historian, and Christian sociologist, Richard D. Ely, and founder of the American Economic Association, by the way, uh, Richard D. Ely believed, quote, government is God's major instrument of salvation. Now, now, now notice the twist here. So it means that you need a, a very strong government in every area, in particular a religious area. Uh, it's, imp it's important for the government to stamp out sin so you can create a, a perfect world so that you have a millennium of the kingdom of God on earth. How do you stamp out sin? Well, but sin it was very broadly defined by these people, very broadly defined. <clears throat> Uh, in particular, we have demon rum, all liquor, including, of course, wine and beer, etc. All liquor has to be stamped out because the clouds men's mind distorts your theological free will and salvation. 
uh, uh, all, any activity on, on Sunday whatsoever except going to church and, and praying, reading the Bible, anything else has to be outlawed, dancing, baseball, you know, whatever it happens to be, moving, you know, whatever, okay, has to be outlawed. And, and, and finally, the, the Roman Catholic Church, which is the instrument of the, of the Antichrist. <laughs> so this is, the, uh, this is the triad of views. And, uh, this is, of course, mostly local and state level, except, of course, for immigration. Now, what, they, what we hear among historians about the nativist movement who want to keep out immigrants, it's all baloney. They didn't want to keep out immigrants. They want to keep out Catholic immigrants and high church Lutheran immigrants. I'll, I'll say why later. But anyway, Catholic in particular and high church Lutheran, they loved Swedish and English immigrants who were pietist and low ch or low church Lutheran. Uh, any Swedish Im immigrant that came to the United States was welcome as an American immediately, even if he didn't know English. Welcome as a true blue American because he was a post-millennial post pietist. So what we have then, since they couldn't outlaw immigration, although they tried to restrict it, <clears throat> uh, the idea is to question the Roman Catholic Church. If that's unconstitutional, get the kids. Outlaw parochial schools, which is a big constant movement, uh, and get the Catholic kids into the public school system, since the Catholic adults are all doomed anyway, get the kids and transform them into Protestants. Uh, the, the whole impetus for public schooling was not uh, you know, crazed left-wing educationists, although they were there. But the real impetus was the Cat what they call Christianize the Catholics, uh, since the real post millennial pie does not believe the Catholics are Christian, they're agents of the Antichrist. <laughs> so you have, now the thing is, these people, uh, uh, one of the, the, the final twist on this thing, the interesting twist, the evangelical twist in the North, was that in order to be saved, not only do you have to believe in Jesus and be born again, etc., you also have to maximize everybody else's salvation. If you didn't, if you slacken this, you wouldn't be saved either. So it was necessary to your own salvation to try to stamp out sin, you see, to try to shape up everybody else. As was, so they weren't, you know, I guess Randy's would call it altruistic. It's not really altruistic. If you want to be saved, you've got to save everybody else. At least try to do the maximum to do it. As a result, these people were fanatic. They were, they were extremely energetic, organized all the time, constantly, at, constantly being politically correct. <laughs> and... <laughs> and um, uh, for a hundred years, people, from, night, from about 1820s until about World War I, on the state and local level all over the country, had these people constantly trying to outlaw liquor, outlaw Catholic schools, and all the rest of it. Okay? And here you have the poor Catholics and, and high church Lutherans. I say high church Lutherans are also liturgical types against this whole sort of thing. They come to the United States looking for freedom and all that. All of a sudden, they're assaulted by these fanatics. Okay? <laughs> Kill, out, crush, you know, particularly... Particularly the Germans, I think, have a very lovable custom. I'm using a subjective evaluation here. Lovable custom, both German Catholics and German Lutherans. Uh, the whole family goes to church on Sunday, and then after the church, they all repair to a beer garden where they hear marching bands and all the rest of it. See? I, I'm like, drinking beer is, first of all, a high sin. Go, doing anything on Sunday except going to church is a high sin. But drinking beer on Sunday is like ultimate evil. I mean, that's, <laughs> I mean, that's it. Yeah, it's, so you have these, these poor beer guns are constantly being ch chomped on, you know, ripped up, assaulted by these band of, band of fanatic wasps. <laughs> so uh, now all this, all this gets translated into political parties. The, 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 the home of the, of, the, of the fanatical wasps, the first the Whig Party and then the Republican Party, uh, the home of the liturgicals, everybody else, actually, is the, is the Democratic Party. It's from way back from the 1830s on. The, uh, <clears throat> so uh, the, the and, and opposition to stuff, as I say, is the, the Catholics and high church Lutherans just want to be left alone. Their ideology at that time was they think sin is up to the sacraments and keeping the sacraments and going to church. It has nothing to do with the state. You don't need the state to enforce the stamp out sin. So they were very much opposed to all that. Plus, of course, uh, they used wine and, and, and church services and all that, which of course is supposed to be deep sin and all the rest of it. So they were, they were on the defensive and the, and the, and the wasps were the aggressors. And everybody else flocks in too, the, the uh, other groups, the, the old Calvinists become Democrats. This is why uh, Gover Cleveland was a Democrat, he was a Calvinist, old stock, non-pietist Calvinist. So uh, the most immigrants were Catholic and more than others. And so the Democratic Party gets bigger and bigger over time. And, and, the, and the, re, the way this gets translated, the economics, is I, see, I was always fascinated by the problem before I learned about all this pietist stuff. I was fascinated by the problem, how did people get so interested in, in the 19th century about, oh, about money and banking and gold and silver and they write illiterates, write pamphlets about it? Why, I can't get my students interested in it. How, how, do these people, how do these people get interested? How do they get interested in technical economics? 
And they're interested, and this solves the, that problem, because they got interested because they start with local religious politics, and they, they expand, their consciousness gets expanded by their leadership to the national economic issues. And it, it worked like this. The WASP f fanatics told their people, look, we need big government on local level to stamp out sin, right? Right. In the same way, we need big government on the national level to increase purchasing power through printing paper money, keeping out cheap foreign goods, keeping out cheap foreign labor, et cetera, et cetera. You need a, a paternalistic, mighty government. Okay, so this, in other words, they expanded the consciousness of, the, of their constituents, their mass base, to broader economic issues. In the same way, the Democratic leadership tells the Catholics and Lutherans, look, the same wasp fanatics who want to deprive you of your liquor and your, and your parochial schools, they, these same SOBs are also trying to deprive you of cheap foreign goods through protective tariff, they're trying to decrease the value of your purchasing power through inflation, et cetera, et cetera. And so they were able to expand the ideology of freedom and laissez-faire from, from religious, from personal liberty to economic liberty. And, and not only were the, the people absorbed this, they were very interested. They got interested in economics because they were originally interested in, re in local religious battles. <clears throat> You can see the connection. And uh, <clears throat> so what we have then is the, uh, as a matter of fact, the Democratic Party was called in this whole period the party of personal liberty. And the Republican Party was called the, the party of great moral ideas, like stamping out sin. Right? <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> so the prohibition movement, of course, was part of it. The prohibition movement was since 1820 trying to stamp out liquor on, on, the, on the entire level. <clears throat> uh, and the government, when the Republican Party had put in very high excise taxes on liquor and tobacco, that was part of that. That was, that was part of this pietist program. The Republican Party, by the way, almost didn't make it to be the second major party. They were, uh, as William Genap in his great book called The Origins of the Republican Party, it's volume one that had just come out, it's very detailed, it's a very interesting book on the early 1850s, points, as Genap points out, the Know Nothing Party almost became the major party, it really beat out the Republicans in 1854. The Know Nothing Party had one principle, crush the Catholics. And it was appealed, appealed to the pietists tremendously. The Republicans who were more interested originally in, in anti-slavery agitation, said, okay, the only way we can lick this is the merge of the Know Nothings, in order to absorb the anti-Catholic spirit, which they did. Um, and uh, Sam and Chase, for example, is a big know-nothing type, and as most of the other Republicans were too. As a matter of fact, Seward of New York was the only not non-anti-Catholic in the Republican Party. He, that's why he didn't get the presidential nomination. He got the Secretary of State ship. Otherwise, he would have gotten the uh, presidential nomination without the anti-Catholic spirit that permeated the rest of the party. <laughs> so um, the uh, what happens is the Democratic Party gets big, bigger and bigger over in the late 19th century. This whole thing resumes, and the, by 1892, a dramatic thing happens, namely that the, uh, the, the Grover Cleveland wins the second term at, on a landslide. For the first time after the Civil War, we have one party running the presidency in both houses of Congress. It was a very close election before that. The Republicans get very scared, and they decide to have to regroup. We've got to do something about this. We've got to change our whole orientation, otherwise we're going to lose out. The Democrats are getting demographics are for the Democrats, and more Catholics arriving all the time. So what the Republicans did on the direction of, of John D. Rockefeller and William McKinley, his, who was a very smart guy, but also his paid agent, uh, they decided to dump the crazies, right? And it was to dump the wasp fanatics. They said, look, guys, we, love pro we too love prohibition. We're just not going to win with it. They, they're the first Republican pragmatists. We're not going to win with it. We've got to dump prohibition. So the prohibitions go crazy. And they have the prohibition party and all that. And they start dumping the crazy. They start tapping down on that. <clears throat> and, uh, and then, well, OK, then what happens is in, the, in, the, in 1896, the fateful year, one of the tragic years in American history, the Democrats, which were a liturgical laissez-faire party, the party of Catholics and high church Lutherans and, and Southerners, were, the Southerners were wasp pietists, but they were, but they were against the evangelical. They didn't, they didn't want to convert everybody. They didn't, they didn't believe it was necessary to their salvation. So it was an alliance in the Democratic Party between the Southern Democrats and the, and the Catholics and, and Lutherans. What happens is, in 1896, the, the pietists get control of the Democratic Party, even more crazed pietists than the, the, the Republicans. The extreme pietists, headed by William Jennings Bryan, grab control of the Democratic Party. Uh, and, it, and it changed the whole tenor of the Democratic Party from then on. And you read the, the, the letters like Cleveland is writing to his friends and stuff, this, this, the end of the, Demo the, the party of, my, of our fathers is, is gone. And uh, so, uh, and the reason, reason why Brian was able to do it is he was able to put an alliance together. Uh, first of all, the Southern Democrats had shifted. By 1890s, they became, they became evangelical too. They started adopting prohibition and all the rest of it. 
So now we have a big new addition to the wasp fanatic group. <clears throat> and uh, he was able to ally themselves with the so-called Western Democrats of the mountain states <clears throat> and, and get a coalition together to take over the Democratic Party. By the way, the Western states were put in, if you look at the list of new admissions of states, a huge number were admitted by 1890 of Idaho and all that sort of stuff. It's only, only states which have no people in them now. Can you imagine how many people they had in 1890? So all these empty states were folded in by the Republicans because they were all pietists. There were no Catholics there. So they were put in because uh, uh, they were all pietists and two solid votes in the Senate per state. Okay? So Brian was able to use this to take control of the uh, Democratic Party. At that point, from then on, we've been to have a total collapse. Parties are no longer, but after 1900, the parties are no longer ideological. They've become centrist. They've become about the same and all the rest of it, the whole thing. So, so the parties no longer, and this, by the way, is the reason, another puzzle I, I was puzzled about. How come laissez-faire sentiment disappeared so fast? I mean, 1880s, lots of people talking about laissez-faire. By 1900, nobody's talking about it. What happened? I mean, intellectuals, guys are getting PhDs in Germany. They shift. OK, but what, what happened to the masses who are in favor of it? What happened to the masses where the Democratic Party was taken over? And parties were very important to them because they, were, they socialized the public. They were the vehicle for public expression of ideology. And when the party disappeared, a vacuum was left for administrative takeover by the power elite, by technocrats, by big business, or by administrators. And that's when the party system began to collapse, and that's when Congress began to collapse, when legislators began to collapse, and the takeover of executive administrators began about 1900. The takeover, of course, is maximized around now. So, uh, I want, so, and, and, so since ideology disappears, the control of political parties by big business begins to be maximized also. There's no check, there's no ideological check on them. And one thing I want to say about the, uh, the presidential elections, for example, nominations, uh, basically the Democratic Party was, uh, control, was not control, influenced, heavily influenced by the Morgans until 1896. After the 1896 convention, <clears throat> it was obvious that the, Bryan was going to win. The Morgan people came to uh, Rockefeller and said, look, or to McKinley, I should say, and Mark Hanna, his, his pal and uh, campaign manager, said, look, we, we propose a deal. Uh, the deal was this. Uh, the Morgans would support McKinley in 1896, provided, and, 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 le and leave the Democratic Party, provided that McKinley, uh, McKinley gives up uh, uh, silver and all sorts of stuff and adopts the gold standard. The Morgans were relatively hard money at that point. So, they, so McKinley agrees to this. The Rockefellers agree to this deal. And they keep only the protective tariff, which, of course, was in their basic Republican principle. As a result, of my 1896 election, the, the, Demo the Republicans have become almost a centrist party. They've given up almost all the pietism. They dropped the anti-Catholic stuff. They dropped prohibition. They dropped immigration restrictions and all the rest of it. They become sort of like now. They sort of, you know, sort of vaguely centrist party. And the Democrats were crazed status, and so the Republicans then McKinley wins on almost a landslide. <clears throat> um, the uh, McKinley, or Morgan's representative in this deal, by the way, was representative Henry Cabot Lodge of the Boston uh, finance, financiers. I have to realize that the Boston Brahmins from way back, the Forbeses, the Lees, the Cabots, the Lodges, were all in the Morgan financial ambit and still are. So if you say Boston, it's going to be Morgan in general. Uh, OK, the, uh, well, in those days, of course, as usual, the, the winning, co winning member of the party, win winning faction gets the presidency, the, as a consolation prize, the loser gets the vice presidency. So McKinley gets the Rockefeller. McKinley was, was definitely a Rockefeller tool. First of all, Rockefeller, I have to realize, for the first part of his career, Rockefeller was a great innovative big businessman. He was great. He was a great cost cutter, innovator, and all that. But, but he was also hip deep in politics. He was also a post millennial Baptist. <clears throat> and Rockefeller was Ohio Republicanism. In other words, Rockefeller was centered in Cleveland for a long time. His refinery was in Cleveland. And he ran Ohio Republican politics. And we have a strange situation. This is something, again, a, hypo a speculative hypothesis, in a sense. Uh, from 1876 to 1920, which is, I think, 16, uh, seven, yeah, uh, it's, it's uh, 12 elections, 12 presidential elections, of which seven of which the Republican nominees were from Ohio. Kind of strange, isn't it? Of course, the <laughs> official Orthodox historians say, well, Ohio is a big state. Yeah, sure, it was a big state, but also there's Illinois and then, you know, New York and all that sort of thing. How come they weren't represented? Why is it always Ohio? It was always Ohio because Ohio was John D. Rockefeller. 
We have Hayes in 1876, have Garfield in 1880, McKinley in 1896 and 1900, Taft in 1908 and 1912, Harding in 1920, the last uh, Ohio Republic, not the last Rockefeller stooge. <laughs> we have a Rockefeller, Rockefeller stooge in the White House right now. Uh, at any rate, the, um, so McKinley, uh, McKinley gets the, the Republican presidential nomination, and Garrett Hobart, I'm sure nobody in this room has heard of, Guess the vice presidential nomination. He was a Morgan banker in New York. Hobart died in office. Now, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm beginning to wonder why he died in office. Maybe he was old. I'm, the, uh, the whole Zachary Taylor thing has really got me going. <laughs> I, I propose that every, every president or vice president who died in office body be exhumed and probe that, poke that a lot. <laughs> now what happens, McKinley gets in, Hobart dies in office. They need another Morgan type to run in 1900 for re-election. Uh, they asked Chance Chauncey Depew of New York Central. He, didn't, he refused. A lot of Morgan people refused. The Morgan people insisted on one of their beloved people, uh, Theodore Roosevelt. And, and McKinley and, and Rockefeller both hated Theodore Roosevelt. They hated him. They said he was crazy. I think it was good, you know, good, good groundwork for that. I was, I was definitely a nut. As a matter of fact, uh, one of my favorite reviews of... Uh, Historical statements or reviews about uh, Teddy Roosevelt was an inquiry magazine, the old libertarian magazine from years ago, and uh, a biography of, of Teddy Roosevelt came out, reviewed by Walter Lefebvre, who's a great, uh, great historian. He, he, his whole theme of the book was uh, the great thing, the thing about Teddy Roosevelt, he liked to kill. Didn't care where he kill, was, whether it was animals or people, kill, kill, kill. He goes, <laughs> anyway, he, uh, Teddy Roosevelt's whole life was in the Morgan ambit. Now, you have to realize here that the, uh, that the, the, the two wings of the Roosevelt family, which we all know, but you don't realize that they have different uh, financial connections. The Oyster Bay, Manhattan, Teddy Roosevelt wing have always been Morgan. And uh, Teddy Roosevelt's first wife was Alice Lee, who was connected with the Boston Brahma, connected with the Morgans. The whole thing was Morgan, from way, this whole ambit. The Franklin Roosevelt wing, the Hyde Park wing of the Roosevelts, were always connected with the Astors and the Harrimans, who were their neighbors in the Hudson Valley. The important, the Astros are not that important. The important thing is the Harrimans who are always, what happens by 1900, <clears throat> okay, is the increasing rivalry in financial networks between the Morgans on the one hand, the Rockefeller, Harriman, Kuhn, Loeb coalition on the other. This begins in 1900 and continues through World War II, or maybe up till World War II. And they, so they have, this is a mighty titanic struggle. Uh, Harriman was a very, obviously brilliant financier who starts as a, I think a stockbroker, a clerk or a stockbroker in, in Wall Street, and he, he, he marries a, a, a girl who is, whose father owns a small railroad in Albany. It's true, it's, yeah, but not much of an advantage. But he, anyway, he's a great financier. He managed to own and control a whole bunch of railroad, one after the other, Northern Pacific, Central Pacific, Southern Pacific, whatever. He takes them all over except Northern Pacific, and then there's a big fight for the, for the power between, between Morgan and James J. Hill on the one hand and Rockefeller, Harriman, Kuhn on the other. So what you have is uh, financial networks, uh, Morgan's reaching out and getting, uh, for example, commercial banks and, and uh, investment banks. Rockefeller beginning to control and own commercial banks and, and uh, investment banks. For example, National City Bank was always a Rockefeller flagship in New York, and Chase National Bank was, and Guaranteed Trust were Morgan flagships, <clears throat> and First National Bank was a Morgan flagship. Uh, Chase National Bank, by the way, shifted during, during the Depression, which I hope I'll be able to get to, to, uh, to Rockefeller control, and of course still is. <clears throat> At any rate, the, uh, so we have, a, 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 and what happens then with, with uh, McKinley is around uh, shortly after, about a year after his second term, he succumbs to the, to the, to the administrations of a lone nut. Now there are many lone nuts in American history. It's funny, every assassination in American history is always by a lone nut, almost every assassination. Every place else is always a conspiracy and they try to find what it is. The United States is always a lone nut, okay? And a lone nut is always disposed of very quickly. Uh, in the case of Guiteau, who shot the, the alleged lone nut, who shot Garfield, killed Garfield. Uh, he was disposed of quickly, had a trial and, and disposed of. In the case of Lincoln, by the way, obviously was killed by conspiracy, and yet somehow in the public mind it was killed by lone nut John Wilkes Booth, who gets up on the stage and he claims something and disappears after that. Actually, it was a conspiracy which was uh, people were arrested in a military tribunal and executed very quickly in secret. So that's never been explored either. I have to exhume all this stuff, exhume it. <laughs> Lincoln, exhume the whole, the whole business. <laughs> so, um, 
McKinley is assassinated by an alleged lone non-anarchist named Leon, Leon Cholgoj, which then made, used as an excuse to outlaw all anar not only all anarchism, but all sedition. A lot of laws where they, where they crack down on free speech even now trace back to 1902 or whatever and the anti-anarchist hysteria. Actually, Cholgoj was not an official anarchist. No, none of the anarchist groups knew him. They thought he was a sort of a, flake, a marginal flake. Uh, attended a meeting or two. We know a lot about marginal flakes and <laughs> movement. So, uh, but yeah, it was, <laughs> it was never deeply investigated. No, who, who did anybody set him up? All this, he was just ex executed very quickly and gotten rid of. And to me, I mean, the, the thing is this, you can call this a conspiracy theory if you will. In any police action, if somebody is murdered, if, you're, if you're some wealthy grandpa is murdered, who's the first suspect? It's the heir, right? Who's the chief beneficiary? It's the granddaughter or whatever? The police investigate. It doesn't mean this heir is, the, is, the, is, the, is guilty. It just means he or she is the first suspect. How come when the president is assassinated, the vice president is never the first suspect? <laughs> <laughs> I, I ask you, how come? Are vice presidents sacrosanct? <laughs> Are they above the moral law? <laughs> So uh, in the case, it, when Zachary Taylor's body was exhumed, I was, I was always sympathetic with the exhumation because I always thought there was something peculiar about Zachary Taylor's death. He, uh, he attended a 4th uh, of July picnic. He ate ch ice cold cherries and, and milk. And he immediately gets stomach cramps and dies a couple of days later. Nobody else got stomach cramps at this picnic. If it was Tomaine, how come he's the only one who gets Tomaine, right? At any rate, uh, so... The idea he was poisoned by arsenic was certainly very plausible. It turns out he wasn't. Well, okay, we investigate it. By we, I mean the, the world in general. But, uh, but the thing, interesting thing is when, the, when, the, when the Ms. Rising's uh, uh, request to exhume Zach Taylor's body was publicized, USA Today, which covered this more than anybody else for some reason, um, uh, and went to Roger, Professor Roger Brown, who's a distinguished expert on violence in American history, and asked, they asked him his opinion. He, first of all, his opinion was a little gobbledygook. Very difficult to understand it. But basically, what he was translated into English, it said that <laughs> she hasn't established anybody would benefit from Taylor's death. What do you mean, nobody? The vice president benefit, Miller Fillmore, <laughs> should be obviously the first suspect. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't take a, a PhD in history to, to absorb that. So, um, so McKinley falls a lone nut, a Rockefeller person. He's succeeded by a crazed Morgan tool, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, nobody's investigated as far as I know the possibility that Teddy Roosevelt was, or Morgans were behind the assassination. I don't say they did, I just like to see it investigated by, <laughs> by a committee with subpoena power. <laughs> 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 All right. So what does Teddy Roosevelt do? He immediately, changes, he immediately changes the whole policy of the United States, interesting enough. He immediately takes the Sherman Act, the Antitrust Act, which is totally in the closet, hadn't been used for a long time. He takes it out of the closet and uses it as a club to smash Standard Oil. Before that, the Rockefeller-Morgan rivalry is more or less gentlemanly. All of a sudden, he goes for the jugular. And uh, he said he's not against all trusts. It's a famous, this is, of course, a famous formulation. He's not against all trusts. He's against good, bad, there are good trusts, he said, and bad trusts. He wants to smash the bad trusts, and he loves the good trusts. What was the criterion of good and bad? <laughs> the bad trusts were the Rockefeller and Harriman trusts. <laughs> the good trusts were the Morgan trusts. <laughs> Very simple. And then he gets the, a, a big a reputation as a great trust, progressive and trust buster. <laughs> and also progressive legislation in general, regulation, food and drug acts, all the rest of it starts with Teddy. Uh, well, the, uh, the uh, Rockefellers were kind of bitter about this, and they retaliated by, uh, by uh, uh, 19, uh, 19, well, they, they couldn't, I mean, Teddy Roosevelt was very popular. By the way, as long as I'm talking about Teddy Roosevelt, I should engage in a little rough rider revisionism. He, uh, the Morgan, Morgan Media, where, where, where parlay the, the, the idea that he was a great military hero of the Battle of San Juan Hill. He, got, he helped get us into the war with Spain, of course, the famous his assistant secretary in the Navy. He writes a tele, sends a telegram to Admiral Dewey, or Co Commodore Dewey, I guess he was, and sees Manila, uh, and uh, that's helped generate the war. At any rate, <clears throat> He, he gets a little command, I guess this battalion of people to go up, to ride up the rough, you know, rough riders to go up San Juan Hill. First of all, it was the wrong hill. Second of all, the guy was half blind, Teddy Roosevelt. I couldn't see anything. So he, was, he managed to get all of his, most of his men butchered in the attempt. It was a total fiasco. And yet, getting out of the army is, is transmuted by Morgan-dominated media into a great her military hero, the strength of which he becomes governor of New York because of Morgan... Uh, uh, campaign funds and everything, and then becomes vice, vice president, and then a lone nut gets him to be president. 
So, um, well, the, more, the Rockefellers are kind of bitter, and uh, in 1908, when Howard Taft, a higher Republican, succeeds Teddy, even though he was a friend of Teddy, the first thing he does, what does he do? He starts taking out the antitrust arm even more than the Rockefeller, and, then, uh, Mor and then Roosevelt, and starts smashing what Morgan trusts. He tries to break up U.S. Steel and International Harvester, the two big Morgan trusts. He doesn't succeed, but the point, then at that point, the Morgans get really bitter. <laughs> They essentially say, no more for now, no more Mr. Nice Guy. And they, uh, they create out of thin air a prog the so-called Progressive Party, one of, the least, one of my least favorite parties in the United States history, which then, under, which then uh, running Teddy Roosevelt for president for a third term, which smashes Taft and, and liberally elects the Democrat, uh, Woodrow Wilson. <clears throat> so uh, we already have, uh, uh, and, and by the way, the, um, uh, the Wilson regime was more, was, Pretty much Wilson, Morgan dominated also with also the contributions by the Guggenheims, the, well, most of the copper industry, and the, and the Filenes, who were the big re, uh, real estate, um, excuse me, retail store uh, 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 powers. <clears throat> so uh, the, uh, basically, however, Morgan dominated most of the administration. So the Morgans had both, essentially had both Teddy Roosevelt and Wilson. They, you know, tails, tails I win, heads you lose. Uh, the, um, okay, the, uh, during this, I should now go back to about 1890s or so, I remember I said manufacturing is now the big business, becoming a big corporate business, not just railroads. And they, from 1898 to 1901, there's very few years, there was a mass merger movement in American industry, a fantastic merger movement, literally several hundred industries merged to try to form a monopoly firm to try to what? Raise prices and cut production. That was the, that was the, it was, it's supposed to be better than a cartel because there was only one company left. Okay? It's supposed to be one monopoly company, which would then rate, you know, cut production and raise price. Well, the whole thing was a magnificent flop -a -roo, just absolute flop -a -roo. Almost none of them worked. Uh, U.S. Steel, which was the Morgan attempt to monopolize the steel industry, was a total loser. It, it, didn't, it lost a share of the market from then on, practically from then to the, to the present day. Extremely inefficient company, uh, totally outcompeted. And the same thing with International Harvester. The whole thing was a flop. Every, in the, the cigar industry, the glucose industry, the whole business. It's a very fascinating book by, old book by Arthur S. Dewing, one of my real favorite uh, economic historians, lived, unfortunately, a long time ago, wrote a great study called Corporate Promotions and Reorganizations, I think in about 1920, 1912, which studied all these um, mergers and showed the whole thing was a flop Peru and shows because, you know, this mergers or cartels don't work on the free market. So what would happen is external pressure would come in. Let's say, for example, the sugar trust. The sugar companies would form a, a merger. They merge. They have 100% of the sugar industry, or 98%. And then a new company would pop up, a new sugar refinery with newer equipment. They outcompeted, and they try to rearrange the cartel, include the new company, and they'd be a flop. And the whole thing just fell, just, just fell apart. This wouldn't work. So at that point, by 1901, when all these mergers have flopped, big business in general, led by the Morgans, but including everybody now, Rockefellers, the whole business decided the only way to, the only thing to do is to do the same thing that was done on the railroads, to cartelize all of industry now, all of manufacturing, in the name of free competition. Uh, and the first step in doing that was to open the books. This is a, a, a replaying the old have no secrets stuff, where various uh, alleged, well, various economists said the thing to do about the trust problem, they write books about the trust problem, uh, Jenks and other people, and they said the thing to do about trust Trusts are okay, we should, but two things. One, we should have federal incorporation, so the federal government can regulate and control it. And two, we should make them open the books, so all the prices would be open, so there wouldn't be any secret price cutting. We know now, of course, what the purpose of that is, to have a government, basically government-enforced cartel. And uh, all of these were flop a uh, Judge Gary, who was the uh, chairman of the board of U.S. Steel, uh, try to cartelize the steel industry by so-called Gary dinners. They have an annual, semi-annual dinner of all the big steel executives. Essentially, they did what I'm talking about over cocktails. You know, let's cut production and raise price. Yeah, yeah, we'll do it. Then they go out and they do just the opposite. So the, but, but the usual view is if you try to have a voluntary cartel, this is what happened on the farm cartel in the late 1920s. Uh, you, you, they tell you, look, if you, if you cut production by 20% or 10%, let's say, prices will go up by 20%. Everybody says, yeah, yeah, we'll do it. And then in the middle of the night, they say, hey, while all these suckers are cutting their production, I'm going to increase my production to take advantage of the higher prices. So, yeah, so they increase their production, and the prices fall, and the whole thing's a flop. 
So they, they, they decided the Gary dinners were a flopperoo, and they decided then that we have to have government cartel, car, forced government cartelization. There's an excellent book on Big Steel, I think called Big Steel and something by Melvin Urofsky, who there's a great quote there, something like, uh, uh, having found they could not uh, successfully uh, have a monopoly or cartel in the free market, they had to turn to the government to, to enforce it, namely World War I. Uh, okay, World War I, it's, it's about my least favorite war of all time. Uh, and uh, a war that was pointless, a tremendous devastation, um, a war that created almost everything we, or everything we think is evil in the 20th century. Government planning, wartime planning, peacetime planning, the whole business. Uh, communism, Nazism, fascism, none of these things would have happened without World War I, the total destruction of, of uh, Europe. Uh, and uh, there's also, of course, no reason whatsoever for the United States to get involved in it. If the United States had not been involved in it, uh, there would have been a negotiated peace in 1916, which probably would have left, which would have avoided most of the devastation and avoided communism, Nazism, etc. Woodrow Wilson, however, insisted on, on, on going in. So now we focus on Woodrow Wilson, the first and I hope last PhD president <laughs> in American history. And uh, he, um, and his role in this whole thing, Woodrow Wilson, was, and generally uh, historians talk about him as a great believer in free competition, rubbish. He was a believer in regulated and cartelization and all the rest of it. He, he had better rhetoric than the other guys. Talk about the new freedom. Watch out for anything called new, with new in it. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt called his regime new nationalism. Wilson called his a new freedom. And there's a new era, the 1920s, the new deal in the, in the, in the, in the 30s. The whole thing is statism. I mean, it's, it's not new at all. It's the old, it's the old racket and a new, with new clothes. So uh, the, uh, yeah, new world order, exactly, is the final. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Wilson, um, Wilson, uh, was no re good reason for him to get us in the war. The, the best, still the best book on our entry into World War I is a book written in 1938 by Charles C. Tansel called America Goes to War. And it's very clear from this book and other studies, etc., that the, one of the major reasons was this. Again, once again, the, the, the stain, the blood, in this came blood ridden, ridden stain of J.P. Morgan and Company. Um, J.P. Morgan and Company, even though powerful, etc., was getting shaky economically by 1910 or so. New, Ho New Haven Railroad, one of their big centerpiece railroads, went bankrupt. So just generally, they were behind, they were big on railroads and not so big on manufacturing. Railroads started a big decline, which, of course, continued throughout the 20th century, around 1900. They were stuck with it. They weren't too good in shifting the manufacturing. They were losing money. Uh, when World War I started, 1914, Trump, uh, and by the way, there's a big role here of Morgan Partners. You have to realize that investment bankers have been until recently, and probably maybe still are, partnerships, not corporations. Each partner in the Morgan company had different functions. There were some partners who were both, whose major function, not regular banking, but political banking, relations with government, and merging. Uh, these people like George W. Perkins, who became the head, the secretary treasurer of the Progressive Party. Uh, Morgan Run Party. There was Harry P. Davidson and uh, extremely powerful George and I uh, said George Perkins uh, and Dwight Morrow, Morgan Partner. All these guys are extremely powerful people. Well, as soon as the war starts, uh, Davidson ho hops the first boat uh, to Europe. Of course, there was no Concord then, which he would have done if there had been. And he, he really establishes already existing ties, cements them with English banking, English Bank of England, English government. His heavy financial interests, um, Morgan was, Morgan's father was a British banker and had constant ties with Morgan Grenfell and company. So the Morgans have always been in foreign policy, what's been called pro-British, which essentially means pro-themselves. So, um, the, uh, so Davison gets over and, and negotiates the following deal with the British government, the British and French governments. From then on, from 1914 on, Morgan, J.P. Morgan and Company have a monopoly in all government underwriting, all British and French bonds in the United States, and a monopoly in all war orders, and was all armament and other orders in the United States. So these guys were like the monopolies of everything. They were getting rake-offs for the whole thing, making millions out of this. And then, of course, feeding war, war contracts to their Morgan-controlled export companies in the United States. It was an unbelievable bonanza. World War I was an unbelievable, unbelievable bonanza for the Morgans. It bailed them out of trouble and it made them extraordinarily successful. The Morgans were committed to English victory. <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, um, J.P. Morgan himself admitted, and other people admitted, J.P. Morgan said something like, 
Uh, from the very beginning of the war, I determined to do everything I could to get the United States involved, into it. Interesting point. Since he, he, him, him doing everything he could to get us into it was more, much more important than, say, me doing everything I could to get us into it, right? <laughs> so, uh, and by God, he did. Now, the interesting thing, interesting thing about it, and I, I toss this out to any budding historians here, is the mysterious figure of Colonel Edward House. Um, the orthodox view of there's nobody, he ran the entire American foreign policy from the time Wilson was elected until through, through, up to, almost through Versailles during the entire pre-war war period. He was never appointed anything, no official post. He was a brain, an unofficial brain truster. Uh, he was controlling foreign policy, not the Secretary of State. And who the hell was he? Who is this guy? He, there's no real biography of Colonel House has yet been written. I mean, here, historians have been writing biographies of, of, every, of every Civil War colonel, right? I mean, there's, there's scads of stuff on everybody. There's nothing on House. As a matter of fact, there's a couple of small books on House of Versailles, very, very narrow there's one antiquarian book about house in Texas. Okay, right? And there's, the only thing else is a, is a multi-volume series of letters, selected letters by house, with an introduction by Seymour. That's really the only thing, uh, only biography of house, only you know, not too many pages, and it doesn't say a hell of a lot. So house is totally unstudied. We have a few leads, however, to house's activities. The usual story about house, there are various psychobabble uh, interpretations of house. Um, Psycho shrink interpretations that House and, and uh, House and Wilson had a strange psychoanalytic type friendship and things like that. that I, it seems to me that's not the key. Here we have a situation of this sort. House is a Texas politician. Okay, he's a, he's a fairly wealthy. He's independently wealthy, and he, he uh, he's a Texas Democrat. Okay, and Democrats are just to be a big day in the sun. So he meets Wilson during the 1912 <laughs> campaign, and he says. Um, and Wilson says, what would you like to do in my administration? And he says, uh, Mr. Wilson, I'd like to run your entire foreign policy. Wilson says, OK. What, what, kind, of, what kind of a thing is this? What, I mean, to, a, to an historian with a cynical eye, a realistic eye, he sort of stopped short of, what is this? Okay. Who is this yokel coming in from left field? And by God, he does run. Not only does he run foreign policy, he picks almost, every, almost the entire cabinet. He picks the entire appointees, all the Texas Democrats, everything else runs through House. Not only that, but House plans the, the peace. Uh, now, the, the, the shrink historians say that House was very loyal to Wilson, like psychologically loyal. Baloney, because we know, for example, there's a great book called The Inquiry by Lawrence Gelfand, an excellent historian. And of course, it, it talks about um, the inquiry was a secret set of historians who, under, the, under the control of Colonel House, who met for several years before Versailles to plan the peace, like carving up Austria-Hungary and that's all the rest of it. So. Uh, the thing is, the interesting thing is there are, some, there are various statements there that Colonel House was, was obvious was plotting with the British ambassador. If Wilson was reluctant to go into war, uh, House would plot with him to induce him to go into it. So he's hardly loyal to Wilson. He's much more loyal to the British. Why was it? What did he have to do with Britain? So here's a really unplowed area. I'd love to see some really good biography of House. It's not been done. I toss it out as a research project. Uh, there are certain leads, however, certain indications and hints. Okay, first, he, he was the owner of a Texas railroad, Brazos and something Valley Railroad, which is connected with the Morgans. Uh, there are other, there are other, there are other uh, indications that he was in the Morgan ambit, but it's very, it's very shadowy, I have to admit that. But um, at any rate, uh, if he was a Morgan tool, it certainly fits in with his general activities, because the Morgans were hip deep in trying to get us in the war, as I said. <clears throat> and House is one of the major people that did it. <clears throat> Uh, the, uh, okay, the, uh, comes the, uh, in World War I, we have a war collectivism, which is unbelievable. It's, it, was, it was both, by the way, war collectivism running the war both in England, France, Germany, and the United States. And the thing about the war collectivism, which fixed prices, production, it had a sort of a corporate state or fascist kind of system where a, a big government would appoint boards of representatives, a big businessman, which, and, and, uh, or, say, commodity sections. The, the, there'd be a steel commodity section, uh, of, uh, say, a steel section of, of the US government staffed by big, big steel men negotiating prices of production with the representative of steel, of steel men you know, across the table, like their own buddies, like the vice president of, of uh, US Steel would negotiate with the president of US Steel. And the, and the, and the, and the steel man and the government was allegedly it was a so-called dollar a year man. They weren't working any funds. It was considered very patriotic. patriotic. They're doing it for free. But they're still getting a salary from U.S. Steel, you see. So you have a very cozy, unbelievable, you know, happy, cozy partnership of interest. I was going to say conflict of interest. Obviously, a partnership of, 
of cartelist interest here. You have a fantastically collectivized system uh, and headed by Bernard Baruch. And uh, the, uh, how much longer do I have, Lou? Okay. Uh, Bernard Baruch uh, was the point of the war dictator, the head of the war industries. Huh? <laughs> That's a real feat of precedent agitation. <laughs> uh, 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 Bernard Baruch was appointed the head of the Tsar of the War Industries Board, which ran the whole uh, industrial system during the war. And by the way, all these guys in charge of it, Herbert Hoover was the food czar. Herbert Hoover was, was, uh, and had been in Britain all the time, was essentially, definitely in the Morgan ambit. Uh, and uh, they had all these teams of cartelists, et cetera, running everything. Uh, uh, the railroads were running, the governments, quote, nationalized the railroads, unquote, which meant that they were, they appointed uh, railroad people to run the railroads. The government would pick up the tab, and the railroads got guaranteed profits out of it. That's the kind of nationalization everybody likes, right? <laughs> you get the profits, and the, and the taxpayer picks up the money. It's socializing pick the tab, socializing costs again in a big way. Anyway, this whole system, this whole fascist system is what it was, a corporate state system, was unbelievably beloved. These people were all young. I mean, Baruch was young. The whole Hoover was young. Uh, they all start on this period. John Foster Dulles was a kid of 21 or something. And this whole gang was plaguing us for, for the rest of the 20th century. They all were long-lived and constantly recalling the good old days of World War I. Why can't we do in peace like we did in war? Why can't we have a collectivized economy in, the, in peacetime? We have this wonderful economic system. Why, do we have to, why does it have to dis disappear when the war is over? So constantly, these guys were trying to get back to, the, to wartime collectivism. The New Deal was wartime collectivism reinstated, as was World War II, and all the rest of it. In the Korean War, they tried the same thing, the same stuff, and the same people. Uh, it's amazing. And Bernard Baruch was unbelievably beloved. You can't imagine how beloved he was. I was, by beloved, by the way, usually with a capital B, I mean somebody who was, to criticize at all is considered a deep sin. And somebody who's automatically revered, without any good reason for it. Okay. And Baruch was, in my lifetime, he was about the most beloved pe person I've ever seen. He was, every, every, every idiotic statement he made was featured on the front page of the New York Times. There were pictures of him on the park bench, uh, dispensing wisdom to every one of, one of the walls. Unbelievable. He was an advisor to every president of every party, mostly Democrat, but also Republican. And he was always invited to be head of this and head of that. The question is, why was it? All my life I've been trying to figure out why this was. And the usual Histor historical uh, answer is that he was, well, he made a lot of money in the stock market. Well, so on. Lots of people made money in the stock market. They're not, they're not made dictator of the war economy. They're not universally beloved. <laughs> so what was it? It's finally, this was finally, <clears throat> this puzzle was finally solved by an excellent book, <clears throat> the only really good biography of Baruch, by the way, by Jordan Schwartz, called The Speculator. <clears throat> and it turns out <clears throat> Baruch was a lousy investor. Whenever he invested on his own in the stock market, he lost money. And the reason he made money, the reason he's beloved, is obviously because he was a sort of a, uh, a hanger-on, okay? I was going to use the term running dog, and I figured that's a little too extreme. He was a hanger-on of the Guggenheim family. Guggenheim interests are extremely powerful, extremely wealthy, which owned the entire copper industry at one point, which have kept a very low public relations profile. What happened was that his father, Baruch's father, was a physician. And uh, by the way, upper-class physicians have been very powerful in American politics for some reason. You always see on boards as in the old days, not so much now, on the board you see so and so and such and such, and, and some physician or to, to uh, you know, some leading power elite person. At any rate, the, um, uh, Baruch's, uh, uh, was, Baruch's father was a physician to, to the top Guggenheim. I think I forget now it was Solomon or Daniel, and who, and who took a liking to the kid Baruch. And he, you know, any, any time there was a, something to invest in, he told Baruch about it. So Baruch essentially made, was powerful and influential and wealthy because of his relationship with the Guggenheim family. Well, that's, that solved it. You know, it's a, a historical puzzle finally solved. <clears throat> At any rate, we, get, um, we have a situation, very, very quick about it. After World War I, this, by the way, I haven't seen this anyplace except an article, an article by Paul Kleppner, one of my fav real favorite historians in American history. World War I was extremely unpopular domestically. It was inflation, there was price control, people didn't like it, which was really the reason for the reaction against the Democrats by 1918, 1920. 1920, the Democrats are shot. They're going to lose. And so, again, there's a struggle. Who should get the Republican nomination? <clears throat> uh, Harding gets it, who was a Rockefeller person, and uh, although also had some Morgan connections, who was sort of perfect. 
uh, Hoyning dies in office. Uh, <laughs> fairly, for a very short period of time. That there, the orthodox view is that he died of natural causes. <laughs> <laughs> However, his body's never been exhumed and tested, <laughs> probed. Uh, now Gaston C. Means, who was a Secret Service agent in the White House at the time, wrote a sensational book after he died called The Strange Death of Warren Harding, where he, which, in which he claims that he was poisoned by his wife. Now, his wife had some good reason to poison him. He was a, sort of a, was now known as a womanizer, had a mistress in the White House and stuff. And he said that also one of the reasons he, Means uh, said was that the, uh, she was trying to save his, his name from the Teapot Dome scandal, which was then erupting. Seems to be a contradictory reason. What the heck? It needs, it needs to be exhumed. <laughs> okay. Was he poisoned? Was there arsenic in, her, in Warren Harding's cherries or whatever, they, uh, <laughs> whatever he ate? At any rate, he, succeed, he succeeded by Calvin Coolidge, who was a Morgan person. Uh, Calvin Coolidge is usually considered sort of a quiet, dumb pol uh, police commissioner. He's much more than that. He was a cousin of the Coolidge, member of the Coolidge family of the Boston power, financial power elite. He was the cousin of T. Jefferson Coolidge, of, head of United Fruit Company. He was part of the power of financial elite and was in the Morgan ambit. <clears throat> His administration then becomes, once again, by the way, a Rockefeller person dies in office under possibly mysterious circumstances replaced by a Morgan vice president. And from then on, we have a Morgan economic policy during the 1920s. I can't go into it here. It's a, it's a Morgan U.S. It's Benjamin Strong, Milton Friedman's favorite uh, Fed, Fed head, Fed director, who's inflating credit in the United States in order to help England, quote unquote, which really means helping the Morgans. And uh, we, we wind up <laughs> with, we wind up with, uh, and Herbert Hoover was a Morgan person succeeding Coolidge, and we wind up with the Great Depression. In the Great Depression, okay, um, in 1932, Franklin Roosevelt Harriman tool uh, uh, defeats, uh, replaces Hoover. And then we have, there's very interesting stuff on this just coming out. Thomas Ferguson, who was a political scientist, I think at Tufts now, is at work on a forthcoming book. The book has been forthcoming for about eight years now, but I'm dying to read it. He's written some artic, very interesting articles on it. Uh, Oxford University Press to be entitled uh, the, the Fall of the House of Morgan and the, and the Coming of the New Deal. Basically, Ferguson's thesis is, which I think, I think is correct, <clears throat> I'd love to read more about it, is that essentially the New Deal policy, economic policy, is essentially a, a smashing of the Morgans. It was a revenge of the Harriman, uh, Kuhn Loeb group, as against the Morgans. Finally, the Morgans got theirs. Uh, for example, the public uh, utility law, which forbade, forbade uh, uh, investment banks from being integrated with commercial banks, was directly ahead of the Morgans. The whole thing was anti-Morgan thing. In the course of that, the Morgans lose control of the Chase National Bank to the, to the Rockefellers. And, he's, and uh, Albert Wigan, I think, was sent to jail, the Morgan person, was then replaced by Winthrop W. Aldrich, the notorious kinsman of Rockefellers, as Aldrich's... Uh, Father, Nelson Aldrich, was Rockefeller's man in the Senate. Uh, Nelson Aldrich's daughter married John D. Rockefeller Jr. It, it seems important, by the way, for, for historians to look at marriages, too. You know, it's, not, it's, it's who are the in laws of these people, not just the same name. From then on, Aldrich becomes the power in the uh, Republican, so called Dewey Rockefeller wing of the Republican Party. There was one wonderful moment, which I remember, I don't remember the year, but Thomas Dewey, who'd been a Rockefeller tool of his life, decides to quit being governor and go into private law practice and make some money. This came out in the Scripps Howard papers, a famous incident. He's called by Winthrop W. Aldrich, head of the Chase National Bank, ordered to come to his office, and Aldrich orders him to run, run again for, for governor, which he, which he does. It's an amazing thing. It's a, it's a, it's a, we don't often get a clear window on how the power elite works. You know, the, here's the, the great governor of New York, a presidential candidate, etc., ordered by the Rockefeller person to run again, and he meekly obeys. So we have, uh, to finish off on this, on the, uh, we have uh, basically the, the 1920s and 1930s can be looked at as a Morgan versus Rockefeller fight, with uh, Franklin Roosevelt being a Harriman Rockefeller person, and uh, Harriman, by the way, being very powerful in the Democratic Party throughout, and uh, usually the role is overlooked. And finally, we get to World War II, where the Morgans and the Rockefellers have an alliance. The Morgans, once again, were in favor of intervention in, in Europe to save Britain and France. Uh, the Rockefellers were isolationists in Europe. They wanted to crush Japan, which was threatening their oil and rubber resources. <clears throat> and so I look at World War II as a mighty alliance between the Rockefellers and the Morgans. Each, each financial group gets their war. <laughs> 
And they go back together again. They love the whole World War II as their favorite war. And Rockefeller becomes, Nelson Rockefeller becomes very important, etc. We emerge from the war with oil being very dominant. And the Rockefeller Morgan Alliance then becomes a Rockefeller headship. In other words, Rockefeller becomes the primary figure in this uh, alliance. And from then on, essentially, Morgan is a junior partner with, with the Rockefellers heading it. This is symbolized by the fact that the Council for Foreign Relations, which was created in 1919, 1920, by the Morgans to, uh, to have a, an internationalist interventionist foreign policy. Uh, and during, by the way, during World War II, we now know the Council for Foreign Relations really up, ran the entire post-war planning of the State Department, uh, headed by Norman Davis, who was a longtime Morgan person. So we have, uh, uh, after World War II, the Rockefellers take over the Council of Foreign Relations and the rest of it and become sort of the senior partners. Uh, we then have a, um, a uh, from then on, the, the financial struggle is very different. From, from then on until now, what we had essentially have is one group, it's not Republican and Democrat, it's one group in both parties, which are essentially Eastern Establishment or Rockefeller Morgan group, and the other is a very loose coalition of Sunbelt types, Southern Rim types, uh, self-made businessmen from usually from Florida, Texas, and Southern California were called the Cowboys. It's a great book by, uh, I should say great, but it's, it's a really a suggestive book by Carl uh, Oglesby called The Yankee Cowboy War, came out about 10 years ago, of, how, of uh, analyzing Watergate and Kennedy assassination, etc., on the basis of, of bitter Yankee cowboy struggles. Uh, on that basis, of course, Reagan was a cowboy coming from Southern California, Bush is a, as a quintessential Eastern Establishment Rockefeller person. Matter of fact, Bush, I think, was financed as early as the Potter Oil Company was financed by the Rockefeller family. So uh, uh, that's, that, brings us, that brings us up to Bush. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>